Our final presentation will be by Claire Barnes. Uh, Claire is a second year master's of religion candidate at Yale Divinity School, concentrating in religion and ecology. Claire has several fields of interest, including food and religion, climate justice, indigenous representation in international climate forums, and gastronomic archives. She currently works at the Beinecke Library and worked at the Yale Divinity, School, the Yale Divinity Special Collections this past summer, about which I think we're going to be hearing some more. <laughs> Claire also holds a master's in international political theory from the University of St. Andrews and a bachelor's in religion and philosophy from Emory University. Please join me in welcoming Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, as Matthew said, my name is Claire Barnes, and I uh, study food and religion um, at Yale Divinity, particularly um, religion and ecology. And I'm here to give, let's see if I can get this to work, um, a general highlight from the collection. I think um, as a student worker in the collection, I would love it if more people would visit the collection, um, especially um, working within smaller archival spaces is quite rewarding um, for both students and faculty. Um, and then I'm going to be focusing on um, some research that I conducted with um, Chloe Starr, who um, teaches this class called China Missions, and so talking about the ways in which students utilize the collections in a classroom setting, but also kind of untangling um, some of the questions and possibilities within missionary archives. Um, and then further areas of study, which are currently still being um, cataloged in the Andover Newton um, collection, which has been added to the Yale Divinity Schools collection. So the history of the Yale Divinity School uh, collections is that there's 6,000 linear feet of archival material in our collections, um, which ranges from pamphlets to microform holdings. We also have several areas of specialization, for example, which I'll talk about later, the China Missions Project, which um, many of the China missionary papers and as well as um, Bibles and translations of Bibles are held in this project, and they were acquired in connection with the China Records Project. Um, the Himalayan Mission Archive Collection in, was formed in 2008 um, as an amalgamation of four different archival um, organizations, and it was transferred to the Yale Divinity Collection from the Center for the Study of World Christianity at the University of Edinburgh. And then finally, the Divinity School also has a rich holding of um, archives that have been transferred from the Andover Newton Theological School, and these are still being cataloged, and there are um, there's room in this, in this collection for um, additional scholarship. Um, for example, here is a um, papyri from the Andover Newton collection. Um, the papyri collection from the Andover Newton collection ranges from um, first to sixth century CE, but this is from the early fourth century CE. Um, the collection also contains personal papers, archives of organizations, pamphlets and papers, and missionary postcards, images, and ephemera. Um, we also have a really interesting collection of translated um, Bibles um, and also Bible folios. So these are big Bibles that would be used in a pulpit setting. Um, so the Bible on that you're seeing right now on the right is quite huge, quite large, like this big. And these are on site. Um, and thinking about the ways in which um, how can we critically analyze missionary culture? We can think about the intersection between linguistics and visual culture within these pieces. For example, a lot of these Bibles are also illuminated manuscripts. So you can see here, um, there's an image of Genesis that has been illustrated. Um, and, and thinking about the continuity between our collections in terms of visual culture, there are also contemporary forms of, of visual culture that are quite interesting in the collection. These are two of my favorite pieces from the collection besides the work that I did in Chloe Starr's class. Um, so on the right, you can see here, um, they're chick tracks. And chick tracks are comic, little um, comic books that, are, that were illustrated by Jack T. Chick um, since the early 1960s. And they document fringe, um, 
evangelical responses to upheavals in American culture. Um, and they're often placed in libraries. So students who will go into libraries will see these Chick Track collections and they'll be inclined by their titles such as Global Warming or um, downtown, oh, Doomtown um, to look at them. But they actually um, are quite um, fundamental, are fundamentalist and they're um, quite conservative. But then on the other end of the spectrum, we have these really interesting pins from the collection that also kind of um, we can think about the evolution of of um, religious visual culture in America particularly with these pins um, and these are from the Henry H Hale Butcher Jr. papers um, and these pins range from 1936 to 2013 and as you can see um, this is one of my favorite pins, School of America, U.S. Government Terrorist Training. And it's not a cue for people um, to think that, oh, we're going to have an interesting conversation about global warming in the evangelical papers, and actually it'll be something quite different. Um, but these are pins that were collected um, by Butcher kind of in response to many things. For, so, for example, you can see J.L. Bush right there, and there's a... Um, conversations within that we can have around these pins in terms of both um, spiritual understandings of American cultural shifts and, and social movements, um, but also in terms of kind of a continuity thinking about um, missionary culture in, in America as well. And then I think as a student in the archives, at least from a student perspective, our archives are a great place to think about um, methodological uncertainties, questions, and possibilities for missionary papers, thinking about um, holding both um, a criticism of the work in our collection as intertangled in colonial and imperial matrices, and then also thinking about what, what these pieces are saying and what... Um, the missionaries are reporting on in, in the places that they are. So for example, if we can think about geopolitical shifts in the countries that these missionaries are in and what they're, how they think about them, how they think about their friends and their families in these countries. And so holding both of those realities and thinking La Mincene was a professor of world Christianity at Yale Divinity, and he in particular was interested in looking at some of the linguistic work that missionaries had done and um, thinking about broadening um, our, our use and understanding of missionary papers, um, thinking about them both critically and thinking about their possibilities. Um, and the Yale Edinburgh Group on World Christianity and the History of Missions continues his work and this line of thinking critically about um, our pieces, not only in terms of their provenance, but in terms of American imperialism and also um, critical things that we can gain from them in, in terms of social and, and um, religious commentary. Um, and they meet every year, and they're also meeting in um, 2022. So that will be, if, so, if y'all are interested in learning more about... Um, the development of uh, missionary studies as a discipline and also rebranded as world Christianity, thinking about um, disciplinary boundaries within the archives is, is quite interesting. Um, so now I'm going to turn to um, my specific research project in China missions, which was with Chloe Starr, again, who is an expert in um, Chinese Christian theology and has published an excellent book on um, Chinese theologians, um, but when I had entered her class, which was an interesting hybrid class between an exhibition style of looking at both um, Jesuit, like early Jesuit missionaries who were in China, um, and as well as translations of the Bible in Chinese characters, and then so that was kind of the first part of the class. And then the second part of the class was dedicated to individual research in the archives. And so when I was thinking about what I normally study, which is religion and food in an American context, um, she had pointed me and Joan and everyone in the archives had helped me get to the Albert and Celia Stewart papers and a particular addendum that had been brought to Yale Divinity and had not yet been processed. Um, so Albert Stewart was trained as a biologist, um, but then served as a university professor at the Christian College at the University of Nanjing. At that point, it was spelled um, with a K, and you can trace the evolution of the college, actually, and its synthesis with other universities from um, the Republican era into the communist era. But he taught at this university. He taught botany, and he ran the um, 
a herbarium there, and he um, was there from 1921 to 1950, um, and was also like interned during um, the Japanese invasion. But I had I focused my research project on um, his papers, and I was interested in looking at the development of what is called an agricultural missionary, um, and thinking about. Um, this in these intersections between agriculture, religion, and national memory and development. Um, in the in his collection as well, there are a wide variety of things. So he has like diaries. Um, in 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 the addendum, which I processed, actually, he has um, ration cards from when he was interned, and he has letters and whatnot. And there are also lantern slides, and lantern slides are small glass slides that you put in a projector, and they're actually quite heavy, so it's interesting to think that they would carry these around to both document to their families, oh, like this is where I teach, for example, this is a image of the campus, or these are some of the challenges that I'm facing in my work. So, um, in this right slide, we can see here it's labeled um, wasteful cutting of forests. But actually, if we dive deeper into his collection, we can see that um, he is engaging um, with different like political and policing bodies um, during the KMT government when um, this, this photograph is actually documenting a moment where um, this is a research forest, and there were um, locals who came and chopped down the wood for fuel because there was resource shortages during um, Japanese invasion. And so he had to engage with different policing bodies within Nanjing at that time to um, kind of balance his um, agricultural work with um, the local conditions. And um, What's quite interesting about his work is that he thinks about his the um, what is often termed by the university as the Christianization of national life with these Christian colleges. He thinks about his work in terms of land, and so he has this interesting um, uh, fusion of thinking about. Um, Relig his religious experience and his experience teaching with um, his work outside of the university because oftentimes um, both him and his Chinese colleagues would go out into the um, um, more local areas and they would either gather plants or they would work on um, like local conditions like if there was um, droughts or, or whatnot. Um, and we have a collection um, thinking about my research in terms of just his papers, I think wasn't, um, it wasn't proving fruitful enough. So then looking at other pieces of the, of the collection, um, we have a, a repository of agriculture and forestry notes, which is at the college that he was teaching at within the university. Um, and thinking uh, the university itself was positioning um, it's work in terms of a larger agricultural policy for China, and it would document um, the all of the professors that had either been engaging with um, agricultural policy talks with um, their, the shifting geopolitical um, lines and um, entities, and then they were also very concerned, and he existed within this university that was very concerned about government recognition of the university. Um, and so thinking um, about um, his work in particular for me was quite useful, um, that he had joined a department with nation-building aspirations as well. Um, and I think that um, he collected um, newspapers from um, both American newspapers and Chinese newspapers that document um, important moments and diplomatic moments, for example. Um, this is at the advent of uh, during World War II. And so thinking about um, his role as a missionary in this complex web of his agricultural work, and as well as um, the history of not the histories and the developing histories of not only China, but um, in where he was a missionary, but of um, the United States and of political relations. Um, and I think um, what was really important for our class is ex is 
um, teasing out um, our understanding of missionary work in different places. And so in, in this example, I was able to look at kind of this complex web and matrices of his, of his life um, to think about how we can push the boundaries of, of missionary work and world Christianity in general. And also what has been really um, quite rewarding for me in terms of this work, not only thinking about like agricultural histories, which I don't think we normally um, connect with missionaries, um, but which I think is quite relevant in terms of colonization and imperialization, um, both here and abroad, um, but that uh, the donor um, for his collection was his son, David Stewart, and he was able to engage with my presentation and add on um, points when I had um, done my final presentation for our class. Um, and so I think that in, in a smaller archival space that is in a larger library network, to think about the relational aspects of our work is quite important. Um, and he, we still email today, and he adds... Um, I think, great insights into some of the work that I had been doing, particularly around his father's orientation towards his teaching and, and his work, um, and also on, on his experience as um, a kid growing up in, in China at that point, um, and thinking about also his, the, family, the family legacy and what, um, as a student worker, um, I, which I had transitioned to after this project, it made me think about uh, in what ways can we better archive our work and in what ways can we handle our, our work so that it reflects not only um, the complexities of our um, of the, the donor's life, but also of, um, of the, his continued fam family legacy. Um, and his son had actually... Um, been a professor and he was quite interested in seeing the development of of this work and so i think that is a great opportunity for students in particular um to be involved with um the donors understanding of their own work and their own um donation um agricultural histories um in Chinese missionary work are also very tied to medical histories. Um, and this is an example of another paper that I worked on um, in which these are the Edward L. Bliss papers that I cataloged um, in addition to the Stewart papers um, and helped with the finding aid for. Um, and this is a really interesting case because um, I had uh, a lecturer in um, medicine reached out to me and had asked, are there any connections in these, in these papers um, between agriculture and, and medicine and religion? And so this is another example of kind of the interdisciplinary work that we can do when we tease out um, the material um, in these papers. And this is um, Bliss with his students and colleagues. And then this, these are examples of what is in his collection. So um, from photographs to letters to passports, which we have. So Yale, the, the Yale Divinity Special Collections are not only a repository for this rich collection of um, Chinese material and, and missionary papers, um, but they're also a repository for the history of YDS. And so um, the Women's Center material is the third collection that I was able to work on as a student worker. Um, and this, this collection was actually quite large. It was 30 boxes compared to um, Stewart's collection was about seven boxes. Um, but Joan Bates Forsberg, who was the founder of the Women's Center, um, was quite heavily involved in um, creating a network of, of female seminarians um, to understand uh, their role, not only as students, but in response to, as I've mentioned with the buttons and the chick tracks, in response to um, different at moments in American history, so different waves of feminism, for example, and also during, there are lots of um, material in this collection on um, women's responses to um, the Vietnam War and um, further, like, um, uh, industrial, like the military-industrial complex, the, its development. Um, and 
they were very focused on not only uh, curricular advancements for using more um, inclusive language in, in their curriculum, but just creating um, an all-inclusive voice for women, which right now is defined by the centers, anyone who self-identifies as a woman. Um, and they, the current YDS Women's Center is still in existence, and they publish a journal called Voice, which is fitting um, for their mission. Um, and we continue to collect copies of Voice. Um, and so this is another way in which the YDS archive um, can be uh, a great resource for students who are interested in um, the development of YDS as an institution. And then these are further areas for study. These are both medieval manuscripts um, from the 1500s, and these are in the Andover Newton collection. Um, this is uh, illustrated um, biblical text from Ezekiel, I believe. And then the image on the right is a Kabbalistic text um, that has a combination, we were looking at it yesterday, of, um, of Hebrew and other languages. Um, and so thinking about um, the, the role of smaller archival spaces and really diving and giving access to, um, to students um, to these like novel um, pieces that most people haven't delved into yet. Um, and so people can, uh, students in particular, working with professors that have a broader understanding, both linguistically um, and materially of the collection can have like a quite personalized experience in the YDS archives. Um, thinking about there are many avenues and rooms for discovery in the archive, as I hope you can, uh, you've seen through this collection, as well as my own research. Um, and there's room for relational um, building within the archive in this way. And so um, here is my contact information. Um, and if you'd like to contact me, that is my email. Joan Duffy is a senior archivist in Yale Archives who can help you um, piece through any of your interests that you have in the collection. And then um, Suzanne Estelle Holmer is um, our main librarian, and she has developed excellent research guides for further interdisciplinary connections um, between contemporary texts and our archival material. So thank you so much. Questions. Happy to start with one. You mentioned cataloging um, when you're talking about the Bliss papers, mm -hmm. and I think it's really interesting what you were saying about donor engagement. Have you thought about? I mean, we're in a moment, right, where we're thinking about how we catalog and how objects have yeah. been cataloged historically. Can you talk a little bit about your work in cataloging, and I, you're you're working with a lot of uh, materials that uh, come into play with current social movements and other things, and how do you sort of navigate that task? Yeah. So when I was first, my so my class project on the Stewart Papers was almost a hybrid project where I um, was able to delve into um, agricultural histories through the, his lens, but also I learned how to internally catalog materials based off of Yale Divinity Standards and external standards. But I think that... Um, particularly for me thinking about provenance is a really interesting question and thinking about for the evolution of world Christianity or missionary studies, how that might come into play. Um, and I, I think that as a young researcher, I think having fresh eyes on um, research collections is really important because we bring in these considerations and these concerns to the archive space. And then it becomes an intergenerational task of figuring out how do we um, uphold the voices and the narratives that are in the papers themselves, such as Albert Stewart, but also how do we interpret them to make them meaningful for our current context and for our current critiques and also the possibilities of missionary work. Um, so I think, I, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs>